my name is Shanna Ranti and I'm a physician assistant with River Chase Dermatology. I am coming to you virtually from our North Naples River Chase office and I wanted to wish you a happy Eczema Awareness Month. October is Eczema Awareness Month, so I thought what better way to kick off the month than by asking one of our local experts all about eczema. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce one of my favorite people on the planet, Laura Taylor, a nurse practitioner with the River Chase Dermatology. She's been with us for many years, and she is our expert in Southwest Florida. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Shanna. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. This is definitely the first time I've done anything like this, so I'm glad to kick it off with you. I know, I know. I so wish we could be, you know, having our coffee together instead of doing this virtually, but um, desperate times and crazy times call for these measures. So um, just wanted to ask you a few questions, obviously, surrounding Eczema Awareness Month. Um, and since this is our very first dermatology download, I wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit, maybe debunk some myths about eczema and about treatments that are out there um, for eczema. Um, so first things first, um, you know, eczema goes by a lot of names topic dermatitis, dyshydrosis, numular dermatitis. For those of us who maybe are not so familiar or don't treat eczema, what is eczema? How do you define it? So eczema is sort of a blanket term for all of those little subsets that you had mentioned, but overall it's a chronic inflammatory condition that generally presents itself with itch and some type of barrier compromise. So patients come in with dry skin, itchy skin. Um, it can start as young as infancy and last as long into you know into your well into your 90s. So it can start at any point in your life. Um, and there's a lot of different triggers, which sometimes we can find, and sometimes the triggers are unknown. But generally, it's an inflammatory condition that is chronic um, that presents with itch, a lot of itch and uh, dryness. And what are the most common sites that are typically affected by eczema? When patients come to see you, where are they itchy? It depends. It can affect head to toe, literally. I mean, depending on which subset we're talking about, and a lot of people can have multiple different kinds of eczema, but it can present fairly commonly in the scalp. Um, we see it on the face, around the brows, around the mouth. When it gets to the trunk and the limbs, um, of course, most of the abdomen, the back, but some of the most classic types of eczema, you'll see, and I don't know if we can get this in there, but the, the flexor surfaces, so the insides of the elbows, behind the knees, um, the wrists, and the ankles. But when we do dive into some of those subsets, you can see it on the palms and on the soles, but it can affect anywhere you have skin. And as far as over-the-counter recommendations, what should patients do or at least try by themselves over-the-counter? I know there's a lot of bold wives tales out there and actually a lot of things are not great for eczema-prone skin. What would you suggest if you feel like there are patients out there that might be watching this that feel like they have eczema, what should they try before calling the experts? They need to moisturize, 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 moisturize. I mean, that is the number one most commonly under <laughs> utilized treatment that's inexpensive it's easy to do when i say easy you know it may be easy for you and i to do but if you are a mom with a one and a half year old who's covered with eczema emollients are not very easy but it's so critical to really preserve that skin barrier and to get the emollients and the moisturizer on there and there's a lot of different ways you can do that you know if i have a 70 year old man walk in the door and he has eczema for the first time or some subset of eczema and I ask them, do you moisturize? Nine times out of 10, they're gonna say no. Getting someone to moisturize their skin can be a feat if they are not in the habit. Every day I get out of the shower, I moisturize head to toe. If I don't do it, my skin gets itchy and I don't even have eczema. So it is a habit that you have to get into, but there's other ways. Instead of just saying, okay, smear some Vaseline all over your body, which isn't really practical, especially here in Southwest Florida, where it's very, very hot and humid, um, I'll recommend for small children, they can do oatmeal baths or some type of moisturizing body wash. And for adults or teenagers, put that body wash in your shower. You're gonna take a shower, hopefully at some point during the week. You might as well get some form of moisture on your skin when you're showering. So do your shampoo, do your conditioner, you know, soap your nooks and crannies, which I also remind them, you do not need bar soap on your arms and your chest and your back. Um, you just kind of need it in the fold areas, those nooks and crannies, but you can use, 
a moisturizing, really hydrating body wash on the limbs and the trunk. So some of the common brands like Aveeno and Dove and Olay, anything that has extra hydrating or moisturizing, they can apply head to toe, rinse it off within a few minutes. And if that's the only step they're gonna do because I just can't convince them to do anymore, okay, so be it. But at least that's better than anything that they had done before. Ideally, they can get that moisturizing body wash on and then within three minutes of stepping out of that shower, they need to lubricate head to toe. Um, I do always recommend creams versus lotions, ointments if they're really severe. Um, but again, it's difficult to have someone apply an ointment all over their body and then put their clothes mm -hmm. on and put a suit on and go to work without making a mess. So I always say, you know, look for something in the jar versus, versus the pump lotion. The creams tend to be thicker. Um, they tend to hydrate better. They have ceramides. You want to look for fatty acids and lipids. There are a lot of very common dermatology recommended brands such as Cetaphil, CeraVe, Aveeno, Eucerin. It's very overwhelming when you get to the grocery store or Target and you're standing in front of that aisle. You know, everyone claims to have something better than others, but really sticking with the basics, the Cetaphil, the CeraVe, the Avenos, that's usually what I recommend. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. If that doesn't cut it itch wise, I'll always recommend some type of anti itch lotion. Sarna is an oldie but goodie. It has that menthol in it, which is kind of cooling to the skin. It has permoxine in it, which is great for itch. And it's a moisturizer and it's not um, a steroid. So they can apply that as frequently as they want. I usually recommend put one on your nightstand and put one on your refrigerator, put one in your refrigerator because the cold promoxine menthol combination really put out that itchy fire. Um, and in the middle of the night, if they wake up and they're just in this, you know, itch scratch cycle, they can break that cycle with the Sarna or there is also CeraVe anti-itch moisturizer, which is a good one. And then if that doesn't cut it, hydrocortisone, plain old generic, over-the-counter cordate or cortisone 10 for some of the really, really hot spots. They can apply that a couple times a day mixed with their moisturizer. I think one of the best things that you said was the fact that they just need to have it in front of them, like put it in their shower or put it right outside their shower. Uh, because sometimes just having that access and having it available is, is critical. And if it's in a cabinet somewhere, you're not going to get it on within three minutes of drying off. So have it available, have it staring you in the face so that it's a good reminder to put it on every day. Put it next to your toothbrush, which another thing hopefully you're doing twice a day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you look at the toothbrush, you're going to look at your moisturizer and at least hopefully it'll trigger some rem some remembrance of, of putting your moisturizer on. Exactly, exactly. Uh, at least we hope. Yeah. <laughs> so let's debunk some myths uh, surrounding eczema. I know a lot of us who see a ton of eczema throughout the day, but are maybe not the experts in the practice, a lot of us will start patients on a topical steroid just for that acute anti-inflammatory therapy. But there are a lot of patients that are actually scared of steroids, scared of using steroids, scared of putting steroids on their children. So let's debunk a myth out there about topical steroids. Are steroids bad for you? No, steroids are not bad you can't be afraid of steroids. And it actually also trickles down oftentimes from primary cares or some dermatologists who don't really treat a lot of rashes. They'll say, oh, you know, they'll really limit the amount that that patient is allowed to use their, their steroid creams. You cannot be scared of steroids or they're not gonna work because if you don't utilize the steroid as directed and hopefully they're being directed appropriately, it's not gonna work. So it's really a waste of time and it's a waste of money. If you're dabbing a little bit, you know, if you're covered with, with, with eczema and you're dabbing a little bit on for a day or two because you're scared of whatever steroids may cause, it's not going to help your skin and you're really doing yourself a, a disservice. So I generally, there's multiple ways to recommend the use of steroids, but I think the general consensus that everyone um, hopefully recommends to their patients is a pulsed treatment. So do it, then stop but then do it again. A lot of people read their tubes and they say, I'm only allowed to use it for 14 days and that's it. And they're thinking ever in their whole lives. So if they need to stop after 14 days, take a few days off, take a week off, but then restart it if needed. Sometimes that 14 days followed by the week off, that seven days allows for too much of that eczema or that skin dermatitis to come back. So I have sort of modified my descriptions now or, or um, directions now, and I'll say use it Monday through Friday, take the weekends off. And that seems to be just much easier to remember. They're still getting the break. The reason why patients are scared, I think, 
is because um, it can thin the skin. And steroids can thin the skin with abuse. And it gets tricky when you do have a severe eczema patient or even psoriasis or any chronic skin condition that's very steroid responsive. They need that steroid in order for it to be effective. But they have to add that pulse in there because if they don't use it, they're going to be miserable and their skin is going to be inflamed and angry and awful. Um, but if they use it too much and they do abuse it, meaning more than twice a day, they don't take a break after two weeks or after that indicated time frame, then yes, the skin can thin. It generally takes a very, very long time for those more like mid to higher potency steroids to cause any thinning of the skin. The systemic absorption that they're actually getting from a topical steroid is minimal to none. So if they're putting a little bit on their flexor surfaces, they're not going to notice an increase in their blood pressure or blood sugar. And I think that maybe that's what they're fearing. As long as they use it appropriately, but diligently and as directed, steroids are critical. Great advice. And do you utilize any of the topical non-steroidals um, to maybe pulse or to maybe have them switch on and off? I do. I will. Um, I like to use what I, I, it's easier to say to the patients, they're a non-steroid anti-inflammatory cream or ointment or topical. Um, so they know that that's what they can use during that Saturday and Sunday or during that week off. Or if they're coming down from a really hot flare, they can transition to those non-steroid topicals such as Eladel, Eucrisa is one of the newer ones, um, Protopic, those of Eladel and Protopic are a bit older, but they can be utilized on the face and more delicate skin areas. Um, they're more indicated for children, but they can quiet the skin down and keep it quiet in between their flares. Great. So what are some of the newest, latest, and greatest uh, medications? I know there's a lot of, of literature, um, a lot of exciting articles coming out about things that are on the horizon for eczema. There is. So out now, there is the Eucrisa, which I had mentioned, which is a topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, um, sort of in layman's terms. It is an ointment. It can be very helpful to quiet down those flares. It can be very helpful for um, pediatric patients who you don't want to use steroids on, they're too young. Um, there are a couple little uh, instructions that the practitioner should use, such as warm the ointment up a bit in your fingers before applying, because it can be a medication that can initially burn, uh, temporarily burn, but usually the burn goes away with time. And sometimes liquefying that medicine between your fingers can help prevent that side effect and educating them. If this burns, you are not having a side effect um, it's just sometimes what happens and your skin is compromised and inflamed anyway. So it just needs to work for a while and then it tends to get better. So topically, the newest, latest, greatest um, is that Eucrisa. Systemically, I have been using Dupixent for a few years now, which has, I have been, we've all been waiting and waiting and waiting for this Dupixent because we do topical steroids and we do systemic steroids and we do pills and shots and all that, all steroid, 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 steroid. And there really hasn't been this opportunity for patients to have a home chronic treatment that can prevent those big flares that they get with their eczema. Um, very, very safe medication. It's great for those classic atopic patients that walk in. You can see the wrinkling around the eyes, the lichenification on their skin. They've had this forever. They are steroided out. They are creamed out. They don't want to put another darn ointment on their body ever, ever again. Right. They've been to allergists. They're on 17 antihistamines a day. You know, like what else can we give suffering. them? Dupixent finally came out. They are suffering. These patients are suffering. So Dupixent has really been miraculous with patients who are comfortable giving themselves injections at home or having a family member or a neighbor nurse do it. Um, I'm sure you could do it in your office as well. If you have a nurse, you know, potentially do the injection for them every two weeks if they're really uncomfortable with self-injecting, but it's wonderful. It's a wonderful treatment that they can do at home and really gain control over what they have been fighting for years and years and years. So for patients who finally seek treatment for eczema and come to you, the expert, uh, what is your typical breakdown of treatment? How do you normally start them on therapy? Um, what do you try first? Good question, because there is, there's always that ladder kind of systematic approach to treating everything, whether it's a precancer or eczema or, you know, psoriasis, there's always sort of this 
stepwise approach to treatment. Of course, like we mentioned, we're going to start with emollients. Um, I usually recommend free and clear products for all patients who tend to have eczematous, itchy skin. Um, so they want to eliminate fragrance and dyes from their laundry detergent and their fabric softeners and really keep it simple with their soaps and moisturizers. Um, no bath and body works, you know, it's a big no-no with eczematous skin. Um, the emollients are great. So moisturizing, 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 and then we can bump it up to um, some of those topical corticosteroids, either low potency, medium potency, high potency. So you can, depending on the body area where they're experiencing the eczema, um, and depending on how bad their flare is at the time, they can sort of pick and choose. I always think it's good for a patient with chronic eczema to have a low, a medium, and a high potency steroid. So because they learn what they need where, and they don't mm -hmm. have to jump into that high potency steroid if they're just having a mild flare. Um, That's a good recommendation. So above the um, topical steroids, there are those non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that we had mentioned, the Eladel, Eucrisa, Protopic. It's always nice for them to have at least one of those, um, whichever one sort of works best for them and doesn't maybe irritate their skin. Um, phototherapy is something that we haven't mentioned yet. Phototherapy has been around for decades and is really, really, really miraculous for eczema and psoriasis and itchy skin. I always um, sort of sell it as one of the safest treatments out there. It's all external. It's just a little piece of the sunlight. It's narrow band UVB light, and it can really sort of act as an anti-inflammatory to their skin. That is great for patients who have more time, who live near the office, um, and who just aren't really to ready to take the plunge into anything systemic. Um, generally we order the treatment for three times a week for about three months and that's the first round and then we generally like to taper them down it is considered a chronic treatment so ideally you know I have a good handful of patients who are doing it once every other week maybe once every third week just to get that little exposure of the UVB light and that keeps their eczema calm um, and then above that is where we get into the systemic medications, whether they're systemic corticosteroids, prednisone, um, Kenalog injections, and then the Dupixent. Kind of in a side box, there are other immune modulating medications that are oral. Um, those are usually reserved for patients who have sort of failed everything else. There's mm -hmm. methotrexate, there's Celsep, there's cyclosporin. So those get... When, when you start getting systemic, oftentimes those require blood tests and kind of serial monitoring of their, of their lab work. So Laura, I think one of the most exciting things that you told us today was that there is hope. So thank you for bringing a little bit of that hope to us today. And thank you for um, maybe giving that little glimmer of hope to patients that are out there suffering with eczema. The most amazing part of this virtual format is that we can broadcast this out to our entire River Chase community um, and let patients know that there are some things that can truly really help them. So thank you for giving that little glimmer of hope to those patients that are suffering. Um, and during National Eczema Awareness Month, maybe they will be more likely to come in and seek the help of some of our wonderful providers here at River Chase Dermatology. So thank you all for tuning in to the Dermatology Download. My name is Shanna Maranti and Laura, thank you so very much for being with us today. Thank you for being our expert in Southwest Florida and thank you for all that you do for our patients. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun.